Hey, everybody, it's Larry Berman here, back from a wonderful week's vacation. Uh, a little knocked off uh, a couple of bucket list items and uh, a couple pictures to share with you. So I've got my Pebble Beach golf hat on, went to visit the family out in uh, California, kids and, and grandson, and ended up getting to uh, play uh, Pebble Beach. So Here's a picture of me teeing off in the very famous seventh hole. If you look really closely, my wife actually, who caddied for me, caught the picture where the ball is actually right, right in flight there. The bad news is I flew the green right into the water. I dropped, I went up and down for a bogey, shot an 83. So qu quite happy with the uh, round there, but that was always been a dream of mine to, to play Pebble Beach and so I took the uh, week off. We didn't do a show on BNN uh, la the week before. And then I was supposed to be back to do the show on Monday. And as fate would have it, Air Canada and uh, their uh, wonderful um, challenging airline, uh, we had a 27-hour delay coming back from Scottsdale. And you might say, well, how did you go to California to see your kids in Golf Pebble Beach and end up in Scottsdale? Well, we, we drove there. One of the other bucket list items my wife and I uh, had was to hike the Grand Canyon. And so here's a picture of me at the bottom of the canyon. We did what's called a uh, southern rim to rim uh, hike. So we, we first thing in the morning started off at the Habib Trailhead, walked down about four hours, uh, got to the bottom of the Colorado River, uh, jumped over the bridges, looked around there, had lunch, and then spent the next six hours walking back and literally got to the top uh, at dusk. So that was literally a week ago right now as I'm sitting here talking to you on Friday. My quads and calves are still hurting me from that mile hike up the uh, mountain on the way back. Oh my God, but if you can ever get a chance to do it, highly recommended. So let's have a look at what happened in the markets this week. And uh, there's been a dramatic change of sentiment as, as all will know at this point. So on, on Thursday night, uh, Treasury, Treasury Secretary Yellen has been taking tremendous uh, heat from Stan Drunkenmiller and others for not having locked in lower interest rates for the U.S. government. Now, the mandate of the Treasury is to facilitate smooth and functional uh, bond markets and bill markets, and it's not to time anything. Um, but you know, they, they do have some discretion. So this week, Janet used her discretion to fund the new debt that they need to fund and the runoff from QT with more bills than coupons. And so what that does is when it's with a bill, they issue it at a discount and there's no interest payment that really goes out. It's just a continuing rolling over. So it's it's it still costs the Fed money but it's kind of like rolling it and kicking it as opposed to having to cut a check and give an interest payment. And so those are the coupon bonds, two years to 10 years. Um, all right, well, one year, one year out, but bills are considered, you know, under a year, they're issued at a discount, bonds are issued at a coupon, two years and higher. And so a drunken Miller's taking her to task and saying, you're gonna bankrupt the the uh, average citizen and the cost of the debt is is going to be astronomical and and on and on and on, and she defended herself by saying on Thursday on CNN that well the average maturity of the bond portfolio is in fact at present uh, you know the duration of the portfolio is of as long as it's been in decades. Well, let's take a fact check here. Uh, Secretary Yellen and actually see. So when we bring up the uh, broad aggregate bond ETF index, AGG in the US is the ticker for it. And we look at the underlying index that Bloomberg now owns control of. It used to be Barclays um, that linked to the iShare ETFs and, and so forth. Anyways, 
the market value of all the c- coupons out there today is about $25 trillion. The average coupon on that debt, right? The average interest payments, a little over 3%. Now, a decade ago, it was only, it was 16.7 trillion and the average coupon was 3.37 3.36 so if you do the math there you can figure out what they had to pay by way of interest payment and then you look can look at the bills now there there are other issues that you know for example um that are are not for trading and not public and and issued directly to other um holders like what goes into social security trust fund etc non-marketable debt they call it when we look at the bills market again 10 years ago 1.17 trillion today 2.4 and you look at the um uh basically the the there's no coupon as as i said but if you look at the average price what you can see there if we look at long term history is when interest rates are zero like like they've been post gfc remember when the dot com bubble burst greenspan put interest rates close to zero so the bills market never really paid a whole lot and that aspect of it didn't cost the treasury a whole lot of money cuz bills were basically zero then they started raising interest rates and the cost went up a little bit and of course recently the cost went up quite a bit um but there is no coupon payment that's the key thing right because the, it's issued at a price discount so that price discount on average now with all the bills issuing um is is 9814 but that, again that doesn't take into account everything that's now being reissued so the new discount for the new one is at 5% for a one year bill for example would be issued at 95 and a much bigger discount compared to 10 years ago where there was no discount you know at all because interest rates were basically zero in the bills market so going back and looking at this you say well the average coupon you know pre financial crisis in 08 was a little over 5% and if you do the math of what's coming due over the next year or so and what that's going to be replaced this coupon cost is going to go back over 4% but it's now 4% based on today 25 trillion but will be 27 trillion and you quickly do the math you see that the interest payment that the US government must pay on the bond is quickly going to be over a trillion dollars compared to where it was historically and that's what drunkett miller is saying that you should have when interest rates were ultra low locked in a lot longer debt instead of issuing it in the bills market and so forth so by way you've you've done a terrible job and you've cost the taxpayers a lot more money i think all that stuff is debatable but the fed really doesn't have that mandate to time markets okay let's roll back to what she did this week she should have issued more coupons the expectation was for her to do that and she didn't and she issued more bills and therefore relieve some stress on duration assets and boom we get a risk on rally compounded by powell pushing the pause button and saying yes higher for longer we may raise interest rates they're not going to anymore because the economy is going to slip into a recession A lot of talk on Friday was the SOM rule. The SOM rule looks at the unemployment rate and the rate of change of the unemployment rate and when it starts to move up by half a percent over a 3 month average window compared to what it was over the last year, then that triggers the idea of a recession. And it's never been wrong in terms of forecasting that. So so that rule is triggering right now that if over the next few months the unemployment rate stays where it is or ticks higher which there's some expectation of 
that that's a virtual certainty that a recession is coming. And maybe why, in part, behind why they've hit the pause button. So when you dig into all this stuff, it's really interesting. How much outstanding total public debt is there? Well, there's the amount. Now, if you looked at the bills and bonds outstanding and you subtract the Fed balance sheet, that's where you kind of now start to get to these kind of numbers. And so when the Fed owns the bond and the coupons being paid, it goes right back to the treasury. There's no real cost to the government. Um, as, as they do QT and shrink the balance sheet, those bonds, that coupon now goes to someone else. And so again, the cost of debt is going up and up and up. What Treasury did this week is kick the can down the road, hasn't solved the problem, but we get a relief rally in equities. And I tweeted earlier this week that we've got a relief rally. Maybe it's worth 44, 4,500 on the S&P, but this is not the beginning of a new bull market. And those suggesting that it is kind of don't understand from my lens um, the impact of higher for longer. And in an economic downturn, which is almost a virtual certainty at this point, given the lagged impact of the tightening, that earnings start to come down and the markets will start to reflect that. So in the last couple of weeks, we had shown this chart where we've broken the trend here and now we're back inside the range. And wow, isn't that a wonderful thing? So when you look at a chart and you say, ha, trend line's broken and now, you know, is it broken? We're back in the range. Should we trend higher now? And, and now we start to have to think about putting a new trend in here and start to do something like this where we say, okay, here's the new trend. And we're okay rallying back up to the trend line, but now the new trend is down until we break out above that and hold for some period of time. And then you can make that argument. So when I look at something like that, I say, well, what needs to happen for us to get above that trend line and hold? Fundamentally, everything needs to be okay. So, on a forward earnings basis, 12 months, we're seeing that the expectation right now. Now, when we get to year end and we roll that forward, what you're going to see on these forward earnings are the projections for earnings growth into 2024 and 2025 and beyond. So if we quickly bring up this screen and say, okay, what is that? 12 month to year end kind of looking like 236 and then for 2025 262 well if we're going to go into a harder landing there's no chance we're getting that earnings growth but that's what's priced in now and you would argue that at a forward multiple of 18 and a trailing multiple near 20 that the markets are still overvalued so all that needs to play out still and the message is caution i did say earlier this week risk on rally it came really quickly the 4400 area here is going to be challenging from a resistance standpoint given the last rally here we'll see what happens um could we get up to 4500 there's all kinds of expectations and reasons why that could happen. Um, and I wouldn't rule it out at all. But again, is this a breakout? Well, I would say if we got above 4,600 and held, then I've got to rethink my whole thesis. But I doubt that very much. Now, where's the market going to end up at year end? You know, again, without the stress of the added supply, Probably, I would say 4,200-ish is still 
you know, reasonable. We talked about how important the support was. It broke for a couple of days and boom, Yellen and Powell to the rescue and we're back up. So again, they haven't fixed anything. They've just kicked that issue down the road. That treasury supply and that unfunded deficit for the next decade, based on the Congressional Budget Office forecast, is still massive. QT, another couple trillion before they run the balance sheet down to where they'd like to see it, still massive. That's all in front of us in an election year. No fiscal stimulus coming. Anyways, we'll see how it all plays out as always, but uh, my message still is is one of caution here. Um, and at some point now in 2024, we would think about getting back to 3,800 or even 36 or 3,500 um, as the harder landing plays out and earnings start to come down. Wish I had better news for you folks, but that's how I see it from my lens. Have a great week, everyone.